morning, or evening, grace, brethren, and such good to have all of you back along with us here with our Temperance Awakening, and I look forward to uh, continuing our lectures uh, here today, and are uh, going to be looking at respiratory diseases, and uh, how that affiliates with smoking, as well as secondhand smoke, and uh, so we'll go ahead now and uh, get started, but everything that we're going to look at today will particularly be to smokers, so uh, this won't, uh, none of what we have today, a whole lot is really going to include like dippers and chewers and so forth. And so looking at, of course, with our respiratory diseases and smoking, probably not a big surprise that smoking causes respiratory disease and it aggravates the respiratory system. The respiratory system involves many delicate mechanisms and numerous safeguards to bring oxygen into the body and expel carbon dioxide. Some structures in the lungs are only one cell thick. It should come as no surprise to find that a habit that involves breathing in smoke, as we said, you know, would have an effect on the lungs. And some of the chemicals found in tobacco smoke are carcinogens. Over time, they cause genetic damage that might lead to cancer. Other chemicals in the tar of tobacco smoke create more immediate damage. Several lung conditions have been connected with smoking, uh, such as chronic, bron chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma. And that's what we're going to look at here in this section. And uh, how does respiration work? And so getting oxygen to the cells deep within your body is a complicated task. Each breath takes air in through the mouth and nose and down the throat, voice box, and windpipe. Then the airway splits into two passages the bronchial tubes or the bronchi. Progressively, progressively tinier tubes, bronchioles, continue to split off leading to the thin walled air sacs where gases pass into the bloodstream. These alveoli air exchange sites look like bunches of balloons. They expand and contract as inhaled air enters and carbon dioxide leaves. And uh, just like balloons, alveoli are very delicate. The walls of these tiny structures are only one cell thick. As oxygen passes through this very uh, fine skin and into microscopic blood vessels, carbon dioxide passes in the opposite direction. Any blockage in the airway between the mouth, the nose, and the blood vessels in these lungs can quickly become a matter of life and death. And when people encounter smoke from a fire, a bus exhaust, or, or some type of pollution, you know, the natural reaction is what? You know, just the, you know, cough, you know, like you end up, you know, behind some, like, diesel truck, you know, that pulls off, like, at a restaurant or, you know, a shopping center or something. You know, you cough. But, see, for smokers, you know, that's where the issues happen. You know, breathing in smoke is an everyday habit, so, you know, you just get used to it and you're not coughing. Now, like people who first, you know, whenever they first begin to smoke, as we often say, you know, they'll cough, you know, you know, usually several times, then, you know, you get the habit, and, you know, you kind of get it down and you're not smoking. And see, the lungs, you know, no longer respond to every cigarette puff with a cough, but, you know, they're still irritated, and it's not just that, you know, they're still irritated, but, you know, they become damaged because you're not coughing anything out. And now looking at chronic bronchitis, the bronchial tubes of bronchi are the gateways to the lungs, and they're heavily defended. Special cells in the lining of the bronchial tubes secrete a sticky, a sticky substance called mucus to trap intruding bacteria or dust particles. The inner lining of the tubes also has tiny hair-like growths called cilia. The cilia work like very small fingers to push the mixture of mucus and debris toward the windpipe, where it will be coughed up and expelled. Simple bronchitis is an infection of the bronchi. When bacteria or viruses attack the walls of the bronchial tubes, cells become irritated and the bronchi become inflamed. The walls of these tubes swell, reducing the width of the air passage. To catch invading organisms, extra mucus is secreted. When this mucus is coughed up, it contains cells used by the immune system to kill bacteria. This mucus, which is often thick, gathers in the narrowed bronchi, resulting in a blocked air route. And the body's response is frequent coughing to clear the blockages away. But anybody who has su and anybody who suffered from like a bad cold or a case of the flu has experienced acute bronchitis. So you know the very minor part. And uh, this condition can also be caused by allergic reactions like breathing and dust or pollution. But the most common case, you know, is smoking. And chemicals in cigarette smoke irritate the tissues lining the bronchial tubes, causing damage and making them inflamed. And the bronchial walls become very irritated, become easily, I'm sorry, easily infected. Extra mucus is secreted and coughing begins. If a person coughs up mucus almost daily for three months and two or more years, then they're considered to have chronic bronchitis. And as the condition persists, repeated swelling thickens and scars the bronchial walls cutting the size of the airway. Extra mucus collects in the bronchi as the normal coughing response becomes less effective. 
Mucus not only clogs the airway, it creates a bacteria-laden soup, which can cause additional infections. And damage from chronic bronchitis is irreversible. If smoking continues and the disease progresses, the patient can end up so short of breath that he or she is unable to carry on everyday activities. You know, when you say those types of people, you know, who are coughing, 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 you know, like they have no energy, you know, it's just a task. You don't like to walk up a flight of stairs. And chronic bron bronchitis may also become a complicating factor for diseases within the lungs themselves. And now we're going to be looking at emphysema. And this is a medical condition in which the tissue of the lungs becomes damaged, making the transfer of oxygen to the blood vessels less efficient. Normal lung tissue is elastic. It changes size as you breathe in and out. Cigarette smoke damages lung tissue, especially the delicate walls of the alveoli, which lose their stretching ability. And eventually, the tiny air sacs tear and merge together. Now, healthy lungs are composed of many alveoli, numbering in the millions. And taken together, the alveoli walls offer about 100 square yards of thin tissue through which oxygen passes to the blood. Diseased lungs become en enlarged, they become larger, and the surviving alveoli also become larger. But the issue is, is there's still more empty space and much less transfer tissue. And inhaled oxygen is wasted, trapped in these oversized air sacs without transferring into the bloodstream. And as alveoli are destroyed, less oxygen is absorbed by the body, and usually the first sign of emphysema is an inability to catch one's breath. But see, like a very healthy person is going to have good breathing. You know, like people like who exercise, you know, and are healthy, you know, they're going to have very good, very good breathing. But you know, like uh, an unhealthy person, like, you know, a person smokes, you know, they have trouble breathing, you know, just like an obese person. And uh, depending on how much of the lung is destroyed, a victim may not be able to climb, you know, once again, even a few flights of stairs or work. You know, and simply breathing becomes a full-time job, you know, just like with chronic bronchitis. And emphysema might run in family. Some people produce less of a body chemical, you know, that helps to protect the lungs. It's kind of, you know, just like anything else, you know, like cancer, you know, that can run in a person's genetics. Or, you know, somebody, you know, that just has obese, you know, genetics to be overweight or people that are very thin. But, uh... But so other causes, though, include oily smoke from cooking or pollution, but the major cause is smoking cigarettes. And countries that have fewer smokers, you know, they also have lower levels of emphysema. And this disease seems to strike about 10 to 15 percent of smokers. And emphysema is also known as the lung rot. People with the disease often die of lung failure from diseases that affect the lungs, like pneumonia or flu. And when chronic bronchitis and emphysema appear together, you know, guess what that causes them? Another uh, pretty popular uh, like disease that you probably heard of. Most people say it in four letters. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And at first the symptoms begin with a mucus-laden cough after getting up out of bed. Then the coughing continues through the day, bringing up increasing amounts of mucus. During the winter, sufferers experience frequent chest infections, coughing up yellow or green mucus. Then next comes wheezing from the lungs after coughing, then shortness of breath after excursion, and eventually after mild excursion, and ultimately even at rest. And although physicians can prescribe treatments to ease the symptoms, damage from chronic bronchitis and emphysema is irreversible, still sadly. And if the diagnosis is made early, patients can stop further damage by quitting smoking. Usually, however, the diagnosis is made too late and patients end up disabled. And now lastly, with uh, these conditions, we'll look at asthma. And asthma is a condition in which air passages to the lung become rapidly inflamed, causing the airways to narrow. And people with asthma suffer from wheezing attacks and breathing difficulties. And the disease can range from fairly mild, like attacks, to very severe attacks that can threaten a person's life. And nobody can predict when attacks are going to occur, how long they're going to last, or how severe they're going to be. And physicians and, like, scientists, you know, do admit that there's still a lot to be learned about the disease. And, you know, they're still doing, on, you know, ongoing research about it. But, you know, the known facts that we have are, you know, disturbing enough. And according to the Merck Manual, the number of asthma sufferers increased by 42% between 1982 and 1992, 1982 and 1992. Then that high rate of growth continued through 2001, uh, when the CDC found that 20.3 million people were diagnosed 
But asthma, and I remember that I was a kid. I remember them talking about that in school and all. And asthma seems to be an allergic reaction with the airways of sufferers responding to various triggers with greater sensitivity than those of the general population. And depending on the patient, an attack can come with exposure to pollen, dust mites, animal dander, uh, sulfites, which is, a, which is a, a food preservative, aspirin, or some other anti-inflammatory drugs, or even cold air. And exercise and stress can sometimes cause an asthma attack, and another major trigger is also cigarette smoke. And during an ad, well, I say cigarette smoke, that could even be from like cigars or pipes, you know, tobacco smoke would be the better word there. And during an asthma attack, the muscles on the walls of the bronchial tube spasms, tightening the tubes and cutting the flow of air. Breathing becomes more difficult. Mucus plugs the shrunken air passage, causing, co causing coughing and wheezing. Symptoms range from minor discomfort to, as we said, you know, possibly life-threatening conditions if the path of air is blocked altogether. Symptoms can include wheezing, a tightness in the chest, and shortness of breath. Sufferers may have a difficult time exhaling and suffer from a persistent cough. Some people have mild asthmatic reactions that can be controlled by staying away from whatever triggers an attack, you know, like pollen or, you know, smoke or whatever else. But for most people, though, with asthma, there are so many triggers that, you know, that they have to get treatment. And at present, asthma can be controlled by various drugs in both pill and inhaler forms, but there's no cure. Physicians, as you know, kind of as we've said, you know, they do have a lot of questions about this. And like scientists, you know, they're still trying to figure some things out. Like why do some people, you know, including some smokers, develop asthma, why other people don't? You know, why do some parts of like the country, you know, even the United States, you know, have fewer asthma sufferers than others? And recent studies show a connection between mothers smoking during pregnancy and asthma and their children. And we'll talk about this in more detail uh, whenever we go over women and smoking, which is actually the very last, you know, lecture that we give. But, you know, most people, you know, probably uh, probably know this. You know, if, if a mother smokes, you know, when she's pregnant, you know, that there's a very high possibility that the child's going to have physical problems and asthma is one of them. A 2001 study by the University of Southern California not only made that link, but also showed that an infant's exposure to secondhand smoke, actually something we're about to start talking about, led to the development of asthma in later childhood. A 2004 study in Finland followed 58,841 children from birth to age 7. The study suggested that women who smoked more than 10 cigarettes a day during pregnancy had a 36% chance of having a child who developed asthma by age 7, and women who smoked fewer than 10 cigarettes a day, they, uh, they deliver children with about a 25% higher chance of developing asthma than a mother who didn't smoke at all. And uh, as we said there, there's more research, you know, that is going into this. There are a lot of unanswered questions, you know, like about asthma and its connection with, uh, really with anything, but especially also tobacco smoke. And then, uh, so, the first part, though, in treating any respiratory condition is simply to, you know, quit smoking or, you know, quit smoking, quit tobacco altogether. Because um, a lot of people do, like smokers, you know, they have these problems, but not be, but not, uh, it may not be linked, you know, to the, to the tobacco that they smoke, but smoking still aggravates the situation. You know, like there are people, you know, like smokers, you know, who have asthma or these other respiratory diseases who didn't really get them, you know, as a result of smoking, but smoking just aggravates it, you know, it makes it worse even if you say, well, I have asthma, but it's not because of smoking, you're smoking, you know, just aggravates it and the best thing that you can do to stop. So now we're going to be looking at secondhand smoke. And secondhand smoke, which is also known as environmental tobacco smoke, or ETS for short, is smoke from a cigarette that escapes into the air. And, you know, whenever a non-smoker breathes in those fumes, you know, they are said to be, uh, you know, in secondhand smoke or engaged in passive smoking or involuntary smoking. And according to the, to the uh, Canadian Cancer Society, it takes approximately 12 minutes for an average cigarette to burn, you know, completely. And smokers actually inhale only for about 30 seconds during that 12-minute period. However, the output from a cigarette is roughly one-half mainstream smoke and then one-half sidestream smoke. And mainstream smoke is drawn into the lungs of the smoker and breathed out again, whereas sidestream smoke is just from the, from the uh, lit tip of a cigarette. And although the chemical properties of the two kinds of smoke are similar, they are not identical. When air isn't drawn through a cigarette, the tip is much cooler and the cigarette doesn't burn as efficiently, a condition known as incomplete combustion. 
And as a result, sidestream smoke releases five times as much carbon monoxide and twice as much tar into the air compared to what enters a smoker's lungs. And when chemist for R.J. Reynolds, one of the biggest tobacco companies in the U.S., investigated tobacco smoke, they found its pollution was 10,000 times more concentrated than auto exhaust on a highway during rush hour. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a lot of dangerous things in it. And other chemists have discovered that the tar particles released in sidestream smoke, besides being more numerous, are only one-tenth the size of tar particles from mainstream smoke. Tinier size allows smoke tinier size, you know, allows the smoke particles to remain suspended in the air longer, leaving a haze and the distinctive smell of smoke in a room hours after cigarettes finish. And also, uh, you know, like if you go into, uh, like somebody's house, you know, who smokes in their house, you know, you have that smell. Then also you have like a, a lot of yellowing on the walls and things. And now the concern, however, is about much more, you know, than just a bad smell or like, you know, walls being colored. Now, the question is, a secondhand smoke a credible issue? Of course, just about everybody now will say yes, but back like in the 90s, you know, in the early 2000s, this was a really big debate. In 1964, the Surgeon General of that time, Luther Terry, released a report linking smoking with cancer. And then subsequent Surgeons Generals released additional reports, including one in 1972, discussing exposure to air pollution from tobacco smoke and examining the dangers of smoking to the health of unborn children, you know, particularly like we just discussed. And as a result, several towns and cities began banning smoking in some public places, of course. You know, now most public places have banned smoking altogether. And the tobacco companies viewed the new, these uh, new laws as a threat. While Californians were voting on a referendum to restrict smoking in public buildings, the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which we mentioned before, uh, this is supposedly a public relations organization uh, that is independent, although they are bankrolled by the tobacco companies, so they're really just controlled by tobacco companies, and they just say what tobacco companies want them to say. No, smoking isn't really that bad. And uh, they actually had a poll done by the Roper organization. And the resulting report, of course, shrugged off several attacks made on the tobacco industry. And the researchers warned the anti-smoking forces' latest tack, however, on the passive smoking issue, is quite a different matter. And uh, actually, it was nearly 6 out of 10 people believe that smoking is hazardous to non-smokers' health, which is up really high over the last four years. And then um, more than two-thirds of non-smokers believe it, and nearly half, you know, even nearly half of all smokers, you know, even believe that secondhand smoke was, a, was, a, was an issue. And that report went on to explain what the smoker does to himself may be his business, but what the smoker does to the non-smoker is quite a different matter. And uh, this we see is the most dangerous development yet to the viability of the tobacco industry. And a tobacco companies responded to this report, you know, much as they had responded to the news that smoking is linked, you know, to cancer, heart disease, you know, asthma, strokes, and things, you know, many years earlier, like in the 60s. They tried to convince the public that scientists actually disagree, you know, about the effects of secondhand smoke, and their goal was to keep people confused and doubtful about the issue. And tobacco companies funded supposedly, as we said, you know, independent foundations for research on indoor air quality and paid for art articles and books to suggest a continuing controversy about secondhand smoke. But then in 1992, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency prepared a major report on the risk of secondhand smoke. The EPA report stated that secondhand smoke caused cancer that kill 3,000 people a year. Fearing that the report would get wide circulation, tobacco companies attempted to kill or at least delay its release, you know, using procedural tactic, tactics uh, like lobbying with politicians and even a lawsuit. And although the lawsuit fell in 2002, the tobacco manufacturers led by the Philip Morris Corporation did delay and cast doubt on the report for 10 years. And today the Philip Morris website has to admit now... <laughs> Public health officials have concluded that secondhand smoke from cigarettes causes diseases. Philip Morris USA believes that the public should be guided by the conclusions of public health officials regarding the health effects of secondhand smoke and deciding whether to be in places where secondhand smoke is present or if they are smokers when and where to smoke around others. And now once again, like looking at children, like we've already mentioned a couple of times. And the presence of secondhand smoke around children may have even more serious consequences, you know, which isn't really all that surprise. 
you know, that it's going to, you know, hurt children more than adults because young children's bodies are still developing and they are, you know, usually more vulnerable to irritants in the environment. And there are at least 40 dangerous chemicals among the 4,000 cigarette smoke. So once again, you know, not surprising that children exposed, you know, to secondhand smoke are going to get more illnesses. In 1986, a pair of reports were issued on the connection between secondhand smoke and non-smokers. Both the Surgeon General's report and the report issued by the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council found that secondhand smoke had negative effects on children. These findings were further confirmed by the EPA's 1992 report. Children whose parents smoked had a higher rate of asthma, to no surprise there. You know, like what we just discussed, a medical condition where sudden swelling could choke off the air passages to the lungs. Medical researchers already knew that cigarette smoke triggered asthma attacks in adults, and in children they found evidence that smoke not only triggers more attacks, but even more severe ones as well. And children who breathe cigarette smoke consistently develop bronchial infections and pneumonia, coughs, wheezing, and ear infections. And for very young children, secondhand smoke has been connected with sudden infant death syndrome, known short as SIDS. SIDS, and that's a medical condition that occurs when a child under the age of one stops breathing, usually during the night, and they suddenly die without no apparent cause. And then looking at uh, just going to go over smoking in buildings, which now you really can't smoke in any buildings, uh, but looking at the information for that. And a uh, moving air, you know, whether that's wind, you know, just natural wind or some type of artificial ventilation, like from a fan, an air conditioner, etc., helps to move smoke away. However, hours after somebody smokes in a room, you know, as we said, visitors, you know, can still come in, you know, detect cigarette smoke. Like I said, if that's like a building or a house, you know, where people smoke regularly, you know, you have yellowed walls and things. And the reason is that the tiny particles from secondhand smoke don't go away quickly. It's not easy to estimate the effects of secondhand smoke on a given workspace. There are going to be many varieties to that. The size of a room, you know, its ventilation, uh, you know, what kind of ventilation does it have, and other factors. And how many people, you know, are going to be smoking in the area, how many cigarettes are they going to smoke, how much time is it going to take. You know, and in most places where smoking is allowed, the indoor pollution rate, the amount of undispersed cigarette smoke in the air remains too high. The solution suggested by many pro-smoking advocates has been improved ventilation, but that's often very expensive and uh, may not solve the problem. And a cigarette smoke can irritate the eyes and cause allergic reactions, as we said, like including asthma attacks. Irritants from smoke can also attack the nose, throat, the airway to the lungs, and the lungs themselves, resulting in blurred vision, wheezing, coughing, choking, and a considerable distraction from work in a workplace. And in an office environment, the odor is very annoying, and the smoke is dirty. And uh, like in some smoke-free office places, uh, things like drapes, like, you know, curtain drapes and upholstery, you know, they don't have to be cleaned as much, because like I said, like when you're in a place where people smoke all the time, you know, you've got all the you know, all the effects of that smoke that you have to clean. And in 2003, the American Legislation, the Legislative Exchange Council, a conservative policy group, reported that 45 states, of course this was back in 2003, they reported that 45 states had laws that restrict smoking in government buildings, and 43 states control smoking in public places. Of course, that's high, high up now, just about all of them do now, all 50 states. And then in addition to that, 25 states had placed restrictions on smoking in private workplaces and healthcare facilities. Laws regulating smoking in government work areas have been set for 39 states, that's back in 2003. And a report on, on, uh, redux, on reducing tobacco use issued by the Surgeon General in 2000 stated that 79% of workplaces with at least 50 or more employees banned smoking or limited to separately ventilated areas. And the thorniest indoor smoking problem centers on the hospitality business, restaurants and bars. And that is, like, still a debate in some states, you know, like, about can you still smoke, particularly in bars. Most restaurants no longer allow it anywhere. And a large proportion of people who patronize the establishments, like we said, especially bars, are smokers. And as a result, waiters, busboys, and bartenders work in an extremely smoky environment. However, attempts to make bars and restaurants smoke and restaurants smoke free often result in angry letters from smoking patrons and complaints from owners that their business is being hurt. And like a major controversy over these regulations occurred in New York City uh, back in 2003 when there was a ban in restaurants and bars with smoking. And one year later, anti-smoking activists held the restrictions as a success while opponents, you know, people who want to smoke there, claimed that the ban had driven smokers from numerous bars and nightclubs and it harmed businesses, you know, while damaging, you know, New York City's reputation for being a city of nightlife. 
And so now what, uh, what really are the risks here about this? According to the American Cancer Society, about 3,000 non-smokers die each year from lung cancer caused by breathing secondhand smoke. So it's a very, very real thing. And at least 20 minutes of exposure to secondhand smoke can make blood platelets sticky, thickening the blood. And this makes it harder for the heart to pump and, raise the da and raises the danger of blood clots, which can cause heart attack or stroke. And according to the, uh, to the, American, uh, to the American Cancer Society, secondhand smoke causes between 35,000 and 40,000 deaths yearly among non-smokers. And uh, this is uh, what we may have already mentioned before. I know from my research in the book that I just wrote, like about tobacco, uh, most research show that women are probably going to be more susceptible, susceptible to secondhand smoke, just like they're more susceptible to just about all of the damages with tobacco. You know, even if they, you know, like a male smoker versus a woman smoker, a female smoker, you know, has a higher chance of getting lung cancer, you know, heart disease, etc. And uh, actually, we have uh, we have an exact. Uh, and a, an exact poll here. Um, <clears throat> well, well, something that was put out by the uh, Center for, Dis for Disease Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention actually showed that uh, <clears throat> that between the years 1995 and 1999, the annual, the average, the average death rate for secondhand smokers total were 38,053, which is consistent, you know, like with what was put out by the American Cancer Society that met secondhand smoke causes between 35,000 40,000 deaths and so the average the average for 1995 to 1999 there were 38,053 secondhand smokers who uh, who passed who passed away because of smoke and scientists have even designed physical tests to measure secondhand smoke exposure they test breath for carbon monoxide and hair for nicotine they've taken samples of saliva blood and urine to be checked for a uh, continent a breakdown product of nicotine, and these tests have shown the presence of secondhand smoke chemicals in the bodies of non-smokers. And furthermore, some of these breakdown products came from cancer-causing compounds. And then lastly here, just uh, looking at this subject, that there's something in the air. Since the first health questions about secondhand smoke were raised in the 70s, the tobacco industry has tried, as we said, to dismiss this problem as a mere annoyance, you know, just barely, you know, just people coughing. However, over three decades, though, evidence has mounted connecting cigarette smoke in the air with a number of illnesses suffered by non-smokers. A vigorous effort by tobacco companies and various organizations funded by the tobacco industry has managed to confuse the issue, but has not succeeded in disproving numerous studies showing problems such as asthma and respiratory problems, particularly in children, you know, and fatal consequences for people like cancer and heart attack attributable to secondhand smoke. And as we said now, you know, the, uh, I guess the anti-tobacco people, you know, really won this war because now, uh, you know, most states, you know, have very strict laws about, you know, smoking, <clears throat> you know, smoking is something most people now can only do in the privacy of their own home or like in, like a designated outside area somewhere. <clears throat> and so, uh, and so that's uh, what we have there for today. And uh, next, uh, the next lecture, we're going to be looking at smoking in society. So, kind of a similar thing to what we're talking about there with secondhand smoke, and then also the history of smoking as well. I'm gonna go back and look at the history. And so, I look forward to that. Come back and be with us, and uh, we'll see you then. So that it breaks and the shadows flee away. I am Brother Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.